Fine. Doing good? Oh, good, good. Uh, call out for the record how much time you have served on this 65 year sentence. Uh, close to 25 years. Close to 25 years. Okay. And uh, uh, say what now? Counting pre trial time. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, yeah, that's what. That's what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. Um, the records I have show that you have 14 years of education. Tell me about your education. Yes, ma'am. Tell her about it. I'm um, a high school graduate and I have about two years of college. What college did you attend? Uh, Oklahoma State University, well, several different colleges. Oklahoma State University, uh, Community College of the Air Force, Southeastern University. Okay. Oh, okay. And uh, what were you majoring in? Uh, originally electronic engineering. I changed it to computer science and math. Okay. All right. Good. Good. All right. Good. Good. And the records I have also indicate that you your marital status is married. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh. uh divorced. You divorced? Okay, that should be divorced. Okay. When did you all divorce? When did you get divorced? Um, not sure about the specific date. It was while I was incarcerated, probably around 2003. Okay, okay. And uh, the records I have also indicate that you are the father of six children. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And where are your children? Big pardon? What kind of relationship do you have with your children? I haven't had any contact with any of them for probably 24 years. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, my oldest son from my second marriage came and saw me for one visit. Uh, and my uh, youngest son in my first marriage came and saw me in a visit while I was incarcerated. Okay. Okay. And so there are no letters or anything? No, my wife refused to allow them to have any contact. Okay, well, all right. That's, yeah, yeah okay. I understand. And, but all your children are grown. They are adults now, are they? Yes. Okay. All right. All right, let's talk about this, uh, this 25 years. Uh, uh, the records I have show that you have 398 days of programs. So call out for me the top three programs that meant something to you to have an impact on on, uh, on you. Uh, the ones that I feel uh, were most important to me. Yes, sir. They, they had an impact on you that, that you felt like uh, really the, made a change. Risk management program. Okay. The men's work or okay. anger management. And the uh, NOBTS program. Okay. Now, when you say risk management, are you referring to the sex offender program? Uh, you asked me, did I attend the sex offender program? Yes. Uh, twice. Once in Angola, and I took it again the second time here at uh, Raymond Labor. All four phases? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what is, your, what is your take away from that? What did I take from it? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned of all the different ways, at least from the risk management, was all the different ways that we uh, try to delude ourselves from accepting responsibility for actions that we do. Uh, justifying our actions, blaming others for our actions, denying our actions. Uh, and I think actually the program is so good, people, uh, not just sex offenders should attend it. And I think it can be used primarily for anybody. Uh, only a few of the risk management factors are actually sexually related. Most of them like blame, deny, and uh, justification. Uh, we do when we grow up learning to do that, you know, from our peers and from our, even our parents, even countries blame, justify, and deny actions and stuff. 
the um, I've been a strong ag advocate and helped uh, as a facilitator for the risk management program for several years, uh, which I enjoyed doing. The uh, from the, the anger management, I got. Uh, I have, I guess, it would be called a passive aggressive personality. Uh, I'm not a violent person or anything, but the when I and I don't like expressing anger, getting into confrontations, but that anger would still be there and it would come out in other ways, uh, which I wasn't expecting. And by learning that and everything, I've been able to learn uh, how those factors appear in my life and everything. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, sir. It's interesting that you say that you're not a violent person. Uh, Big pardon? I see, it, that's, that's um, you indicated that you are not a violent person. And no. I and I and, and you're saying that as you sit here today. Yes. Yeah, not who you were 25 years ago. Well, well I've never been a violent person. The uh, and if you're referring to the attempted murder charge and everything else, uh, then that I was forced to defend myself and injured him worse than he injured me. Consequently, they charged me with attempted murder on it. But I paid a hard price for that violent act, which I'm not talking about the incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, my mind shattered in doing that. The fact that I injured him. Uh, I spent a year and a half at uh, Jackson Mental Health Facility before I went to trial. And uh, I deeply regret having injured it. It still bothers me. All right, all right. Are, are you okay today? Are you are you uh, receiving any treatment from the mental health department? I really don't really make use of the mental health department that much here. Uh, okay. Because they they don't really <clears throat> try to cure or uh, get down to root causes of mental illness. Basically, they medicate you, and I do not like taking medications if I don't absolutely have to. Okay. Okay. So, are you are you on any mental health medication today? No. Okay. Uh, Originally, I was on Valium for like three years or so before I stopped taking it. Okay. Okay. All right. And uh, <clears throat> the records I have showed that you also was a, a GED tutor. You're a GED tutor as well, right? Yes, I spent 12 years uh, <laughs> teaching as an inmate tutor at Great. Uh, Louisiana uh, State Prison. Okay. Did you happen to keep a count of how many you assisted in getting their, their uh, what I said they call it now? Uh, I really couldn't tell you. There was so many people that I worked with over the years. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, well, I know yeah. some people would, some people kind of kept a count of the ones they helped and they got their, their high set. They didn't pass the test. That's the only reason why I was asking. Yeah, some people keep accounting. I see you did. Uh, <clears throat> and looking at your disciplinary record, you've had 13 write-ups in, in these 25 years. Uh, that, that's, that speaks well. I think your last write-up was in 2019. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. So what do you do every day now at the prison? I beg your pardon? What is your job assignment now at the prison? Well, I'm uh, Squad 9 LBI. Uh, 
but I've been working mostly as a peer minister and when that program was being active here <clears throat> and doing uh, ministry work. And I also uh, acted as a concession salesman. Concession salesman? Fishing shed concession. They okay. sell food to the inmates. Okay, okay. So we'll take that. Um, there was some indication that uh, that somebody reached out to the victim, uh, and and uh, and there was statements made that you know the victim's address. What can you tell me about that? Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that. I did write my uh, ex-wife and my children. Uh, okay. Uh, about the parole hearing and about the fact that of the non-unanimous jury verdict, uh, I had an 11-1 jury verdict. Okay. I knew that I would be getting out of prison and that uh, I didn't want to really do parole time here in Louisiana. But I wanted to do parole time outside the state. But unfortunately, you cannot do an interstate compact unless you're with immediate family, which is why mm -hmm. I I uh, never contacted my uh, stepdaughter or indicated anybody to contact her. Okay, because you you know that that is a that is a violation to do that. Yes, ma'am, I'm aware of that. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that that was on that was clear and that was on the record. Um, so if you are successful today and you are paroled, where would you live and how would you support yourself? Uh. Well, if I was granted parole today, I wouldn't actually try to go out on parole this time. I'm really waiting to see what happens with the non-unanimous jury verdict. Okay. If, if that's granted, made retroactive, then I will be totally finished with all my time. Uh, I would then move to uh, Mexico, where I would uh, start working with my church and that in the ministry field in that area. Okay. I'm six years old and I'm, uh, so therefore I qualify for social security. I'm also working on getting my uh, disability benefits from the Veterans Administration. Uh, I'm working on that. And um, if I had to take a part-time job to uh, flush out any uh, <clears throat> resources I need, I would do that. Okay, okay. All right. So even if you, okay, so even if you were granted parole today, you would refuse it, is what you're telling me. Uh, uh, not to say I would use parole, but I would not want to try to get out on the street at this time. Not okay. unless I exhaust all my other possibilities and uh, I can't do an interstate compact. Okay, all right. Well, uh, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Do we have any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Wise. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, good morning, Mr. Waldron. Good morning. You know, I was sitting here listening to you, I guess in utter disbelief. Um, at your lack of uh, grasp of reality. What grasp of reality is that? I'm about to talk to you about that. You sat there, you talked about uh, the risk management program, which taught about accountability, uh, accepting responsibility, uh, denial, and blaming others. And what a great program that was. And yet on October 24th, of last year, you wrote a letter addressed to Alicia. Alicia is the victim in this case, is that correct? Uh, like to read, uh, yes or no? Alicia uh, is the victim in this case, is that correct? I did write her, but she is not the victim in this. My victim, alleged victim, was uh, my stepdaughter. <clears throat> Well, who is, who is Alicia? 
Alicia is my natural. All right, when you wrote her that letter, uh, part of what you said in that letter, the state used fabricated evidence and, and lied about the evidence. You would be suing the state of Louisiana for a half a million dollars. You, claims that, you claim that there was extensive mental illness within your family and that that probably contributed to your uh, situation. Um, you go on and on and on about yourself and how, you know, you're going to get released if the uh, Supreme Court makes the non-unanimous verdict retroactive and the state would be crazy to retry you. I don't hear not one bit of acceptance of responsibility. You sat there and you claimed that you were acting in self-defense when you almost killed Mr. McCall. You cut him so badly uh, his, in his neck, his stomach, that his intestines were visible. His uh, wound on his neck was a superficial cut. And what about the one to his, to his abdomen, Mr. Um, Waldron? Accidental stab wound. Okay, so you see, that's when I say you have no grip on reality and no ability to tell the truth. Uh, I don't have any more questions from of you, Mr. Waldron. And I'll tell you, I'm going to grant your request not to be released. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Are there any more questions? Yes, Ms. Wise. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Go ahead. Mr. Waldron, good morning. Good morning. I just want to just do a brief follow up on Ms. Jackson. You said that this morning and say that you defended yourself from being seriously hurt. Why would someone who's about to go on trial go to the victim's home for anything? Well, sir, like I said, I was mentally ill. I didn't make good decisions based because of that. If I had been thinking in my proper mind, I probably never would have went over there to begin with. However, the uh, I hadn't had sleep in several days. I was, things were getting desperate back in my family, back in Florida. So in desperation, I went over to talk to the man. He decided to take that as a advantage to do away with me, kill me. Okay. So he, he did away tried to do away with you by you putting a knife to his neck, putting a pellet gun to his daughter's head, and they were trying to do away with you. You, you admitted this morning that you were sleep deprived, you were mentally ill. How come 24 years later you, you remember exactly what you want to remember about that day. And you don't remember that you were the aggressor and you went to intimidate witnesses so they wouldn't testify at your trial. I didn't go over there for that purpose. I went there to talk to him. Okay. Sleep deprived, let me hear. <clears throat> And you wanted to talk. Big pardon? Sleep deprived, mentally ill, and you wanted to talk. Right. Mr. Waldron, you have not accepted responsibility. You have 
not come to the reality that you are a violent person. And basically a person who does exactly what he wants, when he wants, and you care less about any other individual. Well, sir, I have to disagree with you, but I Well, will. you can disagree with me, but that's my opinion. Ms. Oh, Wise? Welcome to your opinion, sir. But thank you, Mr. Roche. Uh, looks like we have no other questions. Uh, Ms. Teresa? We will hear from Mr. Bryant Clark, St. Tammy ADA. Uh, good morning, uh, Brian Clark with the St. Tammany District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. um, just a few words about this case. Obviously, listening to what has been addressed so far has been quite uh, shocking and uh, eye-opening as well. Uh, the heinous, uh, absolute heinous nature of these crimes, the molestation of a child then followed up by the attempted murder of, I believe it's the father of the same child. In this case is absolutely beyond reproach and completely heinous. Not only was the victim had her mm -hmm. dignity and had her innocence taken, but then Mr. Waldron felt it necessary to then take the victim's father out of her life as well, just to add on to her misery, add on to her suffering. Listening to the basically cold and calculated answers that have been given, the very measured answers that were given, this looks as nothing more than just an embodiment of evil. And to release Mr. Waldron back into society would be a complete insult to the victim, to the victim's family, and to society in general. And uh, I would oppose any granting of a parole in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear from Mr. Charles Ford, St. Bernard ADA. Good morning, y'all. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm here on behalf of the victim in this case. Uh, she's here with us today. She's on the other side of the table. Her name's Amanda. Uh, when I say the victim in the case, um, by all measures, she is a victim. She was present when her father was stabbed. And um, in many senses, she's a victim every bit as much as anybody else in this case is. I think it's very telling that even as we sit here today, as Mr. Waldron seeks his freedom, that he still can't bring himself to express remorse. He can't take responsibility today and he still claims self-defense. Coincidentally, I'm reading a book about the Charles Manson murders. And when I picked up this police report to read about this case, what I read is every bit as bad as what the Charles Manson murders did. And let me just go through a couple of the things uh, that is, I guess, was proven at the trial of this case. And the first is that they found that the telephone lines were cut to Mr. McCall's house. Secondly, what they found was two bloodstained gloves outside of the present, outside of the, the residence after the murder. And the evidence was that when Mr. McCall broke into the house, and he did break into the house because it wasn't his, that he saw fit to wear a wig, a mask, and by all accounts, possibly body armor, because um, that's what it appeared to Miss Amanda, who, when she came down the steps after hearing her father scream, Mr. Waldron was on top of her father stabbing him. And Miss Wise, as you pointed out, he had stabbed multiple stab wounds to his arms, face, neck, chest, and abdomen. There was also what the uh, doctor found to be a depression in uh, Mr. McCall's head, meaning that Mr. Waldron had struck uh, Mr. McCall with a hammer. At least that's what the suspicion was. So the jury heard all of this evidence. Uh, they heard Mr. Waldron's explanation for it and they found him guilty. 
And the judge, after hearing the same evidence the jury did, sentenced Mr. Waldron to 50 years in jail without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. There was a good reason for that, and that is that uh, Mr. Waldron was a dangerous man, and by all accounts that we've heard today, is still a dangerous man. So with that, I conclude my remarks. And Ms. Amanda, do you have anything that you want to say? I would just like to say that it was not self-defense. Stanley Waldron broke into our house and premeditated everything he did. He did not come to talk at 3 a.m. He broke in. And yeah. <laughs> Can I read it on her um, My name Let is me ask permission. Ms. Wise and uh, Ms. Jackson and Mr. Rocha, do you have any objection to the victim assistance coordinator reading the statement that uh, Ms. Amanda prepared? No, sir, we do not. We welcome okay. that. We well, understand. Thank you very much. Okay. My name is Karen Arias. I'm a victim witness coordinator at the St. Tammany Parish District Attorney's Office. Most importantly, I am related to the victim in this case. Um, so I'm now will read her ex victim in statement. The actions of Stanley Waldron have haunted me for as long as I can remember. Stanley Waldron ruined my childhood with sexual abuse. Images of what he did to me as a child are still stuck in my head. Stanley Waldron broke into my dad's house just before the sexual abuse trial and tried to kill my dad and me so that we could not testify against him in docket number 268835. Stanley Waldron stabbed at my dad 47 times. I saw my dad's insides hanging out of his stomach during the struggle to try to stop Stanley Waldron from stabbing us. There was blood everywhere. He threatened me with a knife and a gun as my dad and I tried to get out of the house to get help. My right hand was cut in the struggle. I had to have surgery and my pinky was nearly severed off and I had severe muscle and tendons in my hand. I'm sorry, severed muscles and tendons in my hand. This was the scariest night of my life. I don't think a person could ever be the same after experiencing someone trying to murder you. I can't just enjoy regular activities without worrying that somebody might hurt me or someone in my family. I am always looking over my shoulder, wondering if someone is going to hurt me or someone in my family. I have nightmares and trouble sleeping and terrible anxiety. I see news articles about offenders being released from prison and committing the same crime sooner, soon after their release. And seeing these type of stories scare me to death. I get anxiety so bad that I can't sleep and can't function properly. At the hospital, I heard my dad screaming in pain as he tried to save, as they tried to save his life. He couldn't have any pain medicine because he had lost too much blood. The doctor came out and told me that my dad was going to die. After staying in ICU, blood transfusions, and multiple surgeries, my dad lived that he wasn't the same. He didn't sleep as he had nightmares, started on healthy coping habits, and suffered with a lot of physical and mental pain. He had trouble at work after the attack. He changed his whole life for the worse. Stanley Waldron caused so much pain and hurt in a lot of lives, not just mine and my dad's, his own children have suffered because of his actions. My siblings had to grow up without a father and on the, and on the income of a single mother. They suffer financial and emotionally because Stanley Waldron. I would be devastated if Stanley Waldron is released from prison. I fear for my life and safety. I worry Stanley Waldron will look for me and hurt me and my family. Stanley Waldron has reached out to my mom, brothers and sisters, recently with the news of his parole hearing. None of them believe he should be released from prison. He had no trouble finding all other addresses and that scares us so much, I can't even express my words. My family members were on a no contact list but they still received the letters. How did he find these addresses so easily? How does an inmate have access to search for people? Stanley Waldron attempted to murder me and my dad while he was out on bond for the St. Tammany Parish sexual abuse case. My dad wanted to me see the justice in that case. Instead, Stanley Waldron made a choice to break into our house in the middle of the night, cut the phone lines and try to kill us. 
I had nothing but fear and anxiety since finding out that there was a parole hearing. I can't understand why there is a parole hearing since Stanley Waldron was sentenced to 50 years at hard labor without the benefit of parole, probation or suspension of a sentence. During the trial, the court indicated that the lengthy sentence was the only way to ensure that Amanda McCall would not be endangered by him again in her lifetime. Stanley Waldron should never be free as I will never be free from the pain, suffering, emotional and mental torment he has caused in my life and my family's lives. Um, also, the one person that is not able to speak at this hearing is Amanda's father as he is deceased. Um, I think that Amanda in, in her letter expressed the, the, how he ended up coping, which eventually ended up leading to his death. Stanley Waldron, in a sense, did complete what he managed, what he entered that house. He killed her father. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that is all of our speakers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is the panel ready to vote? Yes. All right. I forgot, uh, Mr. Waldron, uh, you have an opportunity to make a statement before we vote. Uh, is there anything you want to tell this panel before we vote? Not really. All right, the, thank you. You've all made up your mind already. Thank you. I said, change your okay, thank you. And Warren, I apologize. I forgot for your input. If you want to at this time, you're welcome. Uh, no, ma'am, Ms. Pearl. I think y'all covered better everything. The only thing I would like to uh, put, uh, I would like to say that I disagree with you <laughs> when he spoke about the mental health staff facility not trying to help. I mean, we have one of the best mental health staff in the state. Uh, Dr. Young, our mental health director is, is uh, excellent, uh, highly educated and works tirelessly to help the offenders. And uh, Mr. Waller, his, his level of care is uh, five, which is the lowest level of care that we have. So I would disagree with his statements that he said about that earlier. All right. Thank you, Ward, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you had an opportunity to put that on the record. Uh, I'll be voting because the case was your case was assigned to me, Mr. Stanley. So I'll be voting first. My vote is to deny uh, your request of parole due to the nature of the offense, the age of the victim, the strong law enforcement opposition uh, that's been expressed in the record as well as here at this hearing, and the uh, and the impact that you uh, that you had on the victim. So my vote is to deny your request to parole today. Uh, Mr. Roche. Thank you, Ms. Wise. What, what my, I, I didn't give that statement any credence after six years. I know the level of care that the uh, facility at uh, Raymond Laborde uh, supplies to the offenders, and I didn't believe that for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, Mr. Waldron, based upon express opposition from the DA's office in St. Tammany Parish and St. Bernard Parish, the adamant opposition from the victim, the insufficient time you have served, you've only served 38% of your sentence. The judge sentenced you to 50 years well, I think 65 years, I think, for a reason, for the nature of the crime that you committed and the intimidation that you brought upon the victims of this crime after committing the crime. Personally, I think you're a danger to public safety. You were cold, calculated in the interview this morning. I noticed the, 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 the attitude and the coldness in which you presented the information this morning. And I really think you're a danger to public safety and you were untruthful throughout the duration of this interview 
For those reasons, I'm going to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Mrs. Jackson? All right, uh, Mr. Waldron, a lot of times when I've entered these hearings, I come in sometimes thinking that I'm going to do one thing, but after interaction with the offender, uh, my opinion changes. Uh, my opinion about you did not change. Uh, unfortunately, you reinforced everything that the record revealed about you. So you made up my mind by your untruthfulness, your inability to uh, accept responsibility, uh, the, it, the horrible, horrible nature of this crime. You um, have opposition from every quarter, including the victim. Uh, you have never accepted responsibility for your actions. And I agree with my colleagues. You are a dangerous man because you have no conscience. And I could not in good time. I don't care how many programs you sat in, not one of them penetrated your mindset. You were just a body in the room. And there is no way in good conscience you should ever be released again into society. And so my vote today is to deny your request for an early release. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. So Mrs. Stanley, you have three votes to deny. Your parole has been denied this morning. I want to thank everybody that participated in the process. Uh, we really value your input. Uh, I really appreciate the courage, Amanda, you showed this morning. We thank you. We really thank you. Let's unpack that. This, this case was just something else. Miss Jackson again with another mic drop. This man is delusional. And I have the court records to go over. And who would have guessed? Who do you think represented him at trial? A fool himself. He represented himself at trial. He was then in the position to actually question his victim, his victims. And of course, he was found guilty how one jurist did not find him guilty is madness. I just, you know, some people are just nuts. What can you do? And his uh, head in the sky, just you can see how crazy this man is. He actually thinks that he's somehow going to get this overturned because it wasn't a unanimous verdict and that the state wouldn't retry him again and that he's going to sue for 500,000. It just adds, he's, he's just so, uh, what you would call a full blown narcissist. You know, we've seen people in recent, uh, trials that, match his exact personality. 
I'm not talking about parole hearings. I'm talking about like actual trials, if you, if you know what I'm talking about. And yeah, there's something very wrong and broken with them. It is so great to see not one, but two a dis district assistant district attorney show up to keep this monster locked up. And it's, it's 82 pages long. His, his, uh, the court dockets here, and I need to find a way to go through it efficiently because, but there's so much in it. So I'll put the link in the description if you want to go through it yourself because we just can't do it all here. I don't. I can start with with this. So Amanda testified that Larry was her father and that the defendant had been married to her mother at one time. She awoke on March 12, 1998, after hearing her father screaming. She ran downstairs to find the defendant on top of her father, stabbing him. She did not recognize the defendant at the time because he was wearing a wig and something covering his face. He was dressed in all black, black jeans, black sweatshirt, shoes, Velcro. He was wearing plastic gloves and may have had other gloves over those. Amanda said her father was screaming that he was stabbing to call 911, but the phones didn't work. Her father told her to get help from a neighbor, but the defendant stopped her as she attempted to run out the door. At that point, Larry attempted to run out of the back door, but the defendant caught him in the kitchen where the two men struggled. She testified that she picked up a frying pan and hit the defendant in the head twice, but it did not face him. What a, what a hero. She's sitting there defending her father. The defendant's mask fell off, and only then did she realize it was the defendant. So can you imagine? Remember, he... assaulted her in the sexual nature as I believe she, he was her stepfather. They were going to court. He didn't want her to go to court and testify. So he went to the home to threaten them to not do it. She runs downstairs seeing a man stabbing her father. She tries to call the police and the phone lines were cut. She tries to run out and he chases her down. Then when her father tries to run out, he jumps back on him. She grabs a frying pan and hits him twice in the head. And just like the scariest movies that we watch, his mask falls off and she sees that it's him. This crazed man who already did that to you is now in your kitchen trying to kill your father. And who knows what he will do to you. Amanda said that it was Stan. Afterwards, she grabbed a knife out of the kitchen drawer and tried to stab the defendant several times, but each time the blade broke. Amanda said she thought the defendant was wearing a medical a medieval chest armor that tied on the sides, and he he was wearing armor. She's just like it's just nuts. After they stopped fighting, the defendant stopped stabbing her father. All three went into the living room where they sat down. The, the defendant said it would have never happened if they had made a deal with him. He's like it would never have happened. You just make a deal with me. While in the living room, she kept telling the defendant her father was about to die. The defendant replied that he was not going to die, that he was fine. The defendant even went over to her father and spread apart the wounds and looked inside. 
She also testified that she told the defendant to go into the bathroom and wash up, get out of the house, and let them go to the hospital. After the, the defendant went on to the bathroom, her father told her to go out of the house where he was going to die. She opened the door and her father ran out. Although she attempted to follow, the defendant grabbed her and put a pellet or BB gun to her head, but she still escaped. The defendant chased them, but was diverted by a neighbor turning in, on an outside light. The defendant then fled. Amanda said the defendant had a, had a mallet that, that night, but, um, but took it with him when he left. Amanda also testified that the defendant entered the residence through the sliding glass door and wiggling and Jimmy it open. Can you imagine? Remember, the defendant had been charged with 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 this of Amanda. The defendant now now this is where he's cross examining her on the stand. Remember, he he represented himself. So now, not only does she do this to him to to her he. He assaults her of a sexual nature, he goes into the house and tries to kill them. And then she has to face him on the stand. Wow. And again, to think that he's still sitting here today saying it was self-defense. You just, the madness, you can't make it up. I, I wonder why he didn't get a life sentence or multiple life sentences. You know, it is possible. I have seen judges say, I'm not going to give you a life sentence because then you're by default allowed to have parole after 25 years. So I'm just going to give you 60 years without the opportunity of probation or parole. Maybe that's what happened here. I would like to think that's what happened here. Defendant asked why. Now, this is the defendant acting as his own representation. So he said, Why? Uh, asked her why she told the police that he had been charged with um, with this with when the only charge was for was for this. It was for molestation. It wasn't for, you know. And she replied, so now she has to answer him. She replied that she wished he would have been charged with this. Because that was what he did. The defendant asked him, at least she got the, you know, why did you say that? That And he said, well, because he should have been, because that's what you did to me. The defendant asked Amanda how she got the cut on her hand that night. And she said it happened as she helped her father back, bend back the knife that the defendant had placed her father's throat. The defendant quizzed Amanda about her attempt to stab him in the back. So here he is sitting up there in front of the jury asking her questions. He probably thinks in his mind he's doing the most amazing job. Uh, breaking the knife in the process, interfering that it was then um, breaking the knife in the process, inferring that it was then that she cut her hand. Lawrence uh, confirmed that his ex-wife had voluntarily surrendered custody of Amanda to him because of problems in the household of his ex-wife and the defendant. He confirmed that he pursued some action in St. Tammany Parish with regards to those problems, and that was go ongoing on a date he was attacked by the defendant. He testified that on the night of the attack, he had fallen asleep on a sofa after watching TV when he was awakened by a blow to his head. He also felt a knife raking across his neck. He opened his eyes to see a masked figure in front of him. So this is how it happened. He's asleep when the guy hits him in the head with the mallet and then pulls a knife across it. But no, no, no. He's just defending himself. He just wanted to talk. He just wanted to talk. Mr. McCall recalled that it felt like the defendant had heavy plastic on his back and chest. He stated that he did not know that the defendant was an attacker until his mask came off after the struggle had moved into the kitchen. He said he was cut on his chest and hands during the course of the struggle and that he was def defendant was definitely trying to 
off him. He also testified that the defendant stopped him and Amanda from running out the door. He said he was feeling so weak that he had to lay down on the sofa. He said that based on his emergency medical service training, oh, he had training, he knew that at the rate he was bleeding, he would soon be unconscious. He believed he spent six days in the intensive care unit and another week in the hospital. He confirmed on cross-examination that the defendant had him had hit him only once in the head. Uh, Mr. Call said it on direct examination that he was in his underwear that night. The defendant self-reported that he lost 65 to 70 pounds, poor guy. He was declared competent to stand trial in 1999. Uh, the defendant had problems in prison, so it was thought best to keep him in the forensic facility until he was went to trial. He continued to receive psychological treatment. Uh, Dr. Carrington believes in the defense distress of being in jail resulted in acting in such a fashion, likely the result of being sent back to a more hospitable environment. Uh, Dr. Kieringen said that his role was not to address the defendant's state of mind at the time of the offense, but to res restore the defendants to competency. And the defendant had no write-ups. What a shock. On that note, it was great how the warden called him out. <laughs> you know, sometimes the warden sits and talks to the inmate after, but when they have here... For someone to go and bash the the bash the facility of the prison that the warden is in there, just oh man, uh, it was great. He's just kept he just kept like kicking himself in the face. He's like, I actually don't want to get parole because I don't want to deal with any of it. I want to. And he's like, okay, really? Wait, you think you're gonna play reverse psychology with the parole board? You moron. Carl Waldron testified the defendant lived with his wife after being charged in St. Mary Parish for doing that to Amanda and released on bond. The defendant worked, uh, worked during this period. When asked how the defendant coped with separation from his wife and family, he said that he was quite concerned. Took a part-time job as a cashier so he could send more money to his family. Sure he did. It's really unbelievable. You know, can you, I uh, just, the, the nightmare of what occurred in this situation, he does that to this girl and then sneaks into the house to finish them off. And it's just remarkable. And then that insult to injury, he represents himself so that he can, he can put them through another level of intimidation. And then they had the courage, she had the courage to face him again. Part of his appeal was saying that uh, he shouldn't have defended himself. I love how they fight to defend themselves. And then the part of their appeal says, oh, you shouldn't have allowed me to defend myself. It's, it's just so, this is really a gem, thank you, Richard, again, um, of a document in terms of there's so much in it. Um, here it is. Let me show you this. This one was great. So... This is all the questions the judge was asking him. Are you sure you want to defend yourself? Um, uh, 
when asked what uh, the defendant, um, the trial court noted that one of the motions the defendant was fighting that date indicated he was giving the state note. Uh, where is it? The trial court concluded by stating that it agreed with the general rule that a person should not represent himself, but found the defendant certainly demonstrated a capacity or an ability to do that. The court noted that as early as July 6, 1998, when Dr. Culver testified, the defendant was aware of his legal system, although the court did not parrot that he found the defendant knowingly and intelligently waived his right to counsel. It is obvious the trial court made that finding. Um, the defendant acknowledged to the trial court that the uh, court did a commendable job of exploring with him the wisdom of representing himself. The defendant submits nonetheless, in this case, considering him established mental instability. It was, oh, this is his, he said no, but because he was mentally unstable, it was an error to permit him to be counsel. He recalls that Larry... He further testified after receiving mental health treatment, examining the evidence of the case, it began to recall details of the incident. He recalls that Larry, no, it was Larry, lured him into his home and attempted to off him. And the defendant acted in self-defense, although he said the single life-threatening wound he inflicted on Larry was inflicted accidentally. <laughs> she can't make it up. The defendant argument conflicted his acknowledgement of the adequacy of the defendant's self-representation of legal competency. Court advisor is almost always unwise for a person to represent themselves, whether a lawyer or a layman, and that it's usually worked at their detriment. The defendant acknowledged that he had heard that as well, and the as well as the adage that a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. <laughs> he said that. Yes, you are a fool. You are a fool for a client. You are a fool for a lawyer. You are a fool in general. You are the epitome of a cockroach. They could make a movie out of this. It is really a thing of, it is just so scary. And this man can never see the light of day for the safety of everyone involved in this case. It is just terrifying. And he thinks he can sue the state of Louisiana. It's, um, it's a, what a clown. What a clown. Really is, really, it's amazing to say. And really, if you if you didn't if you didn't see it, you might not believe it because it's hard to believe that people like this exist, but they do. And uh, as part of why we do this, people, uh, it helps to understand and see with your own eyes how evil does exist. And um, maybe you know someone like this in your life, and. Uh, it's time to stop making excuses for them because you can't fix it. You can't fix it. But with that, I'll let you go.